Um, thank you all firstly for joining this evening. Um, what I want to do is, let's do this. Okay, it looks like most have joined. Um, just give me a thumbs up in the chat box if you can see my background of this map. Okay, perfect. Um, so with regards to what I'm talking about today, um, I want to talk about why I love the Sabi Sands. It's got a slightly different twist to it. Um, I think there's a couple of reasons why I do love the Sabi Sands uh, from a game viewing point of view, uh, but also from a history point of view. Uh, so I would like to, during uh, the course of this webinar, I'm going to run through a little bit of the history of the Sabi Sands, um, what makes it what it is today, um, as well as a little bit about the guides in the area and um and also obviously the lodges in the area and uh yeah so just pretty much how it got to what it is now so the sabi sands let me go back a picture if i can hold on no, just, sorry let me do this and then Sorry, everyone, I'll get there. Okay, that's better. Okay, so what we've got here is the Sabi Sands. This whole area here that you see in dark green, that is the Sabi Sands. It's adjacent to the Kruger National Park, which you'll see in the next map. Um, how the Sabi Sands got its name is from the two major rivers that run through the area. The first being the Sabi River, which runs on the southern section of, uh, the, of the reserve. Uh, and then the Sand River, which runs pretty much 45 degree angle through uh, the Sabi Sands. There is also another river called the Manileti River, which enters uh, from the Manileti a little bit further up. Um, it doesn't really flow very often unless uh, there's heavy rainfall or flooding in the area. Uh, and that's the, due to it having a very small catchment area. Whereas the Sand River flows pretty much all year round. It starts in the foothills of the Drakensberg mountain range, um, which is to the west of the screen here. Um, just to touch on the Drakensberg mountain range itself, it's, uh, it's a massive uh, mountain range. It runs all the way down the northeastern side of South Africa, down the coastline towards KwaZulu Natal, and is over a thousand kilometers in length. So it is a massive, um, a massive, massive mountain range. Um, if you have a look at the Sabi Sands, we've discussed how it got its name. It was established in about 1926 uh, by Mala Mala. They were the first dam reserve uh, on the property and followed the following year in 1927 by Londolozi. After that, a number of different um, lodges started to pop up in the area. I'll go to the next map here. Um, you can see there's quite a few private sectors uh, since that have been set up. You've got the Kasiri Nature Reserve here, Timbavati. Uh, there's also the Baluli Nature Reserve, Manileti Game Reserve, and obviously the Sabi Sands here down in the southwest. This big chunk of land that you see here, that's the Kruger National Park. Um, to the east, it's bordered by Mozambique, this black line here. Um, north to south, the Kruger National Park is roughly about 350 kilometers in length and in width it varies between 50 and 80 kilometers depending um, on where you are. So it is a massive chunk of land. It's an area that is larger than Wales, just to put it into perspective, um, and a massive piece of land for wildlife. So 
just diving into um, the history of the Sabi Sands. Um, the Sabi Sands is about 75,000 hectares, so a relatively large piece of land. Um, all privately owned properties. And now going back quite a few years, in about 1964, uh, there was a fence that was erected here between the Sabi Sands and the other private uh, properties and the Kruger National Park. And the reason for this was to stop the spreading of foot and mouth and other disease in the area. On the outskirts of all the reserves is um, cattle farming. So to prevent disease from entering the Kruger National Park, the government made the decision to put up a fence between the private sectors and um, the Kruger National Park in the hopes to stop the spreading of, uh, of these diseases. Now, this had a massive, massive impact on um, the private sectors such as the Sabi Sands. And the reason why I say that is many years ago, um, similar to up in East Africa where millions of uh, wildebeest and zebra migrate every year, a similar process happened here in the Kruger National Park. There's an area north in the Kruger National Park called the Lobombo Mountains. Um, and wildebeest used to migrate from uh, the Lobombo Mountain Range down south, excuse me, sorry, down south through the Kruger National Park and then west into these private sectors. Now, having put up these fences, um, these animals weren't able to do that. And it was estimated that about 18,000 wildebeest alone died due to the fences being put up. Um, which obviously has a massive impact on uh, the game animals, not only um, did it affect the, the wildebeest, but other animals such as elephants and um, other antelope species. So it had a huge imp impact on the wildlife. Um, so what then started to happen in the private sector, like the Sabi Sands, is that um, you, it was a very balanced area because you had the movement of these large herds of animals such as the wildebeest, elephants, um, buffalo moving through the area that would often keep these large open plains that you see in the Serengeti and Tanzania, not on that scale, um, but it would keep these big open grass plains nice and open. Now putting up the fence and removing that um, and not having those animals move through the area, it started to allow encroaching species to take over. Um, so encroaching species that I'm talking about here are uh, raisin bush and bush willow. And they grow extremely quickly and they can take over these grass plains within a matter of a couple of years. Uh, and what this does then is it limits uh, vegetation for certain animals such as the, gra such as the grazers. Um, there's no food availability for them. Um, and yeah, so they start to die off obviously because of competition between each other and not having enough food. But also with this, with all, these different, with all this new vegetation forming, uh, it started draining the land. So what happened was the water table started to drop quite drastically. Um, so what happened is the Varty family got in touch with an ecologist. Um, his name was Ken Tinley. Um, they got in touch with him in about 1978, 1979. Um, he's an ecologist and he believes that you mustn't worry about the animals. You've got to worry about the land. So you pr protect and persevere the land and the animals will thrive on their own. So his plan was to look at the area, the Sabi Sands, along with a few of the other lodges in the area um, and try and identify key areas that, um, that the Sabi Sands needed to work on in order to get it back or restore it to its natural point before the fence was, was erected. And it was quite an intense process. He took aerial photographs dating back to the, the 1940s and he started to look at individual parts of the Sabi Sands and areas that needed work. And the areas that needed work were um, things like the seep lines. So seep lines are where the water table um, is really, really close to the surface. Um, the road networks on these seep lines because that's created a lot of uh, headwood donkey erosion. Um, the clearing, so where the natural clearings were. Um, and he wanted to now start to try and manufacture and manipulate a plan that he could then 
um, start to open up these clearings um, and hope for the water table to start rising. So what they did over a couple of months is they brought in a bulldozer. They brought in a lot of manpower with machetes and um, pangas. And the guys with the pangas and machetes walked through these clearings, cutting down all these um, small shrubs that were all these encroaching species that were forming. Um, and the bulldozer started plugging up these eroded dongas. Uh, they then looked at the, the different properties and identified key areas as to where to start creating new water holes, new water sources where um, once the water table started rising, um, would be effective to hold water for longer periods of time, but also be able to be in good areas or good catchment areas for rain um, during the rainy season to push water into those water sources to keep water for as long as possible. Um, Andrew, why are there so many leopards in the Sabi Sands? I'll touch on that a little bit later on. Um, so yeah, just in terms of uh, the, the plan and the system put in place, um, as I said, it's a very difficult one to bring back just because of um, the damage that had been done uh, due to the fence. And as I mentioned, a number of different animal, well, a number of animals died during this time. Um, the fence didn't stay up forever. As you know, today there are no fences between the Sabi Sands and um, the Kruger National Park, so animals can roam freely. Um, and Ken Tinley's plan worked very, very well. So by removing this fence, it obviously takes a lot of time for animals to then move um, move back into the area. You know, they, they come accustomed to having the fence there. Things like elephants, they don't necessarily have a territory. They have more of a home range, which they move around in. And quite interestingly, in about 1992-93, these fences were dropped. So what they did is they brought in about 200 wildebeest uh, from a game farmer, someone who um, breeds animals and sells them to different reserves. You know, in South Africa, we've got a lot of uh, these, what we call closed system reserves where um, animals, well, you have a reserve that's, for example, 11,000 hectares, um, and you've got a certain amount of animals in that area, and you've got to manage the animals as opposed to manage the vegetation. So these game farmers will then sell their animals to the reserves um, and supply them with whatever the reserve needs. And in this case, because we had lost so many wildebeest, yes, bringing 200 is not going to replace 18,000, but um, it was a start to reintroducing more wildebeest back into the area. They collared a few of the wildebeest that they reintroduced, um, as well as some of the existing wildebeest in the park, just to see and study their movements to see if they still moved from the, the Bombo mountain range down south through the Kruger National Park and into the private sector. Um, interestingly, before I move on to my next point, interestingly, these 200 wildebeest that were introduced into the Sabi Sands, it took about two months for all of them to be eaten. Um, and the reason I say that is they were actually brought from an area where they had no idea about predators. So things like lions, leopards, hyenas, cheetahs, it was easy meals for them because these wildebeest had never seen um, a predator. They didn't really know to be afraid of them or to, to run away from them. So they became easy targets. Um, now, just getting back to the animals being collared, Interestingly, the migration pattern stopped completely and the behavior of the animals changed completely. What we saw now is that the wildebeest, um, the males would go off on their own. They would leave the herds. They would set up a territory. They would try and find an area with good uh, food availability as well as good um, water sources. So these males would mark out the territory by using um, their preorbital glands on their face, as well as their pedal gland between the hoof, and they would create what we call a wildebeest scrape. So they would defecate, they would scrape their feet in it, rubbing that, gl that pedal gland, so, which secretes the scent, marking the territory. Um, and then uh, they would also rub their faces on the trees. And what they would do is they would try and attract females into the area and once they had a group of females in the area, then they would try and keep them there for as long as possible so that they could obviously mate with them and spread their seed. 
So interestingly enough, it stopped this whole um, migration of wildebeest in the park um, and their dynamics have changed completely. Now, having dropped the fences, I spoke about the elephants a little bit earlier. What the elephants do is quite interesting. Um, with dropping these fences, they actually send what we call a pilot bull into these new areas. So it's generally a young, a young bull or a few young bulls. They move into these areas, they feed on the vegetation, they pretty much scout things out, and then they would return back into the Kruger National Park and pretty much spread the news uh, about the Sabi Sands as an area that it's safe and that everybody can go there. And that's how um, the elephant herds started moving back into, into the area. Um, with all of this maintenance on the land, uh, even to this day, there's still a lot of maintenance um, that is done by areas like Sabi Sabi, Mala Mala, uh, Londolozi, Singita. Um, because they had put so much effort in all those years ago, um, trying to restore the land to what it was before the fence was put up, there's still an ongoing maintenance plan that has to happen today. And because we're not seeing those movements of wildebeest like they used to, um, there's still the chance of these encroaching species taking over the area. So what they do is they do something which we call patch mowing. And it sounds silly, but it is very effective. And that means that they'll take a, a tractor with a lawnmower and they'll literally go from one, uh, from one, from one area to the next um, and they'll just cut down these shrubs as they go along. So just to keep these grasslands nice and open. And, um, sorry. Um, and then, yeah, so just to keep these areas nice and open uh, and it still continues to this day. So moving on, I just wanted to chat a little bit about the lodges and the guides. If I can move this now. Okay, there's a nice picture there. Um, the Sabi Sands, another one, reason why I love it is because of the quality of guys that come through uh, the Sabi Sands. Um, a number of different lodges, you look at Sabi Sabi, Mala Mala, Londolozi, Singita, all the other lodges in the West, they all um, put a lot of extensive training into um, into their guides. Uh, so yes, the lodges vary from very small lodges to um, very high-end, luxurious five-star lodges. Um, but what makes the Sabi Sands the Sabi Sands is the guides. So I know myself, I worked at Londolozi for just over four years. Uh, and I went through a grueling training session um, before I was allowed to step on a vehicle with guests. Uh, and even though I'd guided before, and I had uh, my qualifications, I wasn't allowed to go straight into guiding. I had to do it the Londolozi way. Um, and during that, that period, you do things like um, you learn about astronomy, grass, animals, you do presentations, you do all of that kind of stuff. Um, and you learn obviously about the history of the reserve and how it got to what it is today and why it is so important for us uh, to preserve areas like this. Um, and I think the guides alone, in the Sabi Sands have a very good respect for the wildlife. Um, majority of the guides are very, very good um, and have a good understanding of animal behavior as well as all of the vegetation. Um, and so it is about protecting and preserving the land um, as well as the animals. And it's about creating um, this bond with animals out in the field to be able to see sites like this that you see on the screen. Um, Without many, many years and generations of individuals as guides, but also generations of wildlife, um, sightings like this wouldn't be possible. So here is a nice female leopard walking towards me. Um, this, there's quite a few shots here that um, are some of my favorite shots from Londolozi, and I'm not going to talk about each individual one, but I'll talk a little bit about the experience and a couple of the images just to um, give a little bit of background about them. Um, this leopard here, she's known as the island female. She's my favorite leopard, um, walking straight towards us. And 
um, sitting here in lockdown doing these webinars and putting presentations and things together really allows us to relive special moments. And um, looking at this photograph here, it takes me back to some of my first guiding days when I guided in the Baluli. And, you know, there I could go three weeks without seeing a leopard. And when we did see a leopard, it would be a fleeting glimpse at night driving back to the lodge. It would run across the road. We would have the spotlight on it. We'd sit for a split second, celebrate that we saw a leopard and that was it. Um, so moving to an area like the Sabi Sands, um, I really developed this appreciation for, um, for leopards in particular. I do like leopards a lot, obviously. So you will see, um, you will see a few leopard photos here. Um, but I just wanted to show you some of the images and show you how close we get to the animals. And it's, it is perfectly safe. Um, we'll touch on why it is safe as we go on. Nice elephant bull coming down the road, um, nice and relaxed. So part of all the guide training um, and the training that I remember going through uh, was learning about animal behavior. Um, so it's not only the trust uh, issue with uh, animals out in the field, but it's, it's us as individuals and guides and local guides being able to understand animal behavior, understanding that we are in their space um, and also just reading their behavior. Is he relaxed? Isn't he relaxed? Um, are we fine sitting here? Um, if not, he would give a warning sign similar to us in humans. I mean, you're not randomly going to punch me in the face. Okay, you could potentially, but I think you get what I'm trying to say is I'll give you, you'll give me a warning sign, your voice will, tone will change, your, your facial expression will change. Um, and I'll know to back away. And it's very similar with wildlife. I um, mean, as long as you as a guide can recognize those, those signs and um, remove yourself from the situation, you, um, you, are, you will be fine. This one I wanted to bring up. Um, these are a set of female leopard tracks. Um, I thought I would share this just because it was a big part of why I loved working in the Sabi Sands. I know a number of different reserves do um do the same thing they use trackers so the tracker sits on the front of the vehicle um, they look for animals but they also look for any signs of animals on the road so that can be anything from um, drag marks so where animals have dragged like an elephant dragging its trunk or predator dragging um, its kill across the road or tracks like this and i always loved being able to get off the vehicle with my tracker and watch them do their trade you know these guys the local the local guys um, the trackers are all Shangan. Um, now, Shangans come from, originally from the Zulus. Um, the Zulu people are from KwaZulu Natal, but there was a split. The Shangan individuals moved further north into um, these parts of South Africa, as well as Mozambique. And this part of their life was instilled from a very young age. So in their culture, what would happen is uh, the boys in the family would look after their father's um, livestock and they would let the, the cattle out in the morning and then they would track the cattle down during the day and bring them back in the evening to make sure they're nice and safe. Um, along with that though, obviously there were still predators. It was very really wild farming back in those days. So they had to be able to recognize uh, different predators tracks such as lions, leopards, hyenas and all of that. Um, and that is still practiced today, just obviously in a different way. And I think it's an incredible part of the guest experience. Um, I know as a guide, I was constantly amazed at how well um, these individuals were able to, from a single track that you see here in the mud, be able to find, um, find an animal. And to go a little bit further than that, a lot of the trackers would know which leopard it is before they found it. Um, so it, you were obviously not always successful in finding the animal, but I think from a, a guest point of view, and I know from a guy point of view, it was always such an exciting thing, such a, such a thrilling thing to know that you've got fresh tracks of a leopard or a lion and you're following it um, and you're looking for signs of broken twigs and, um, and, and tracks and direction the animal's gone. Um, and I think for guests to see that and experience that and, you know, follow the process and eventually hopefully find the animal, it just creates for a much better story. Um, and I think that trackers add huge value to, um, to a safari. Yeah, this is a nice buffalo bull. Um, quite an old buffalo bull, I say is a bull because of the horns, they're called the boss. Um, but you'll notice that there's quite a bit of mud on his face and his horns, he's surrounded by 
um, flies. And um, I just wanted to share this picture because he looks, uh, I could think of nothing worse than being surrounded by that many bugs. Um, but what larger animals and darker skinned animals such as buffaloes, elephants, rhinos, and even things like warthogs do um, is because they don't have sweat glands like us humans is they'll roll around in mud, especially during the summer months and during the heat of the day. Uh, and what this does is similar to us, we sweat, a breeze blows over our bodies, it cools us down. Same thing for them. A breeze blows over their body, over the mud, and cools them down. But unfortunately for this guy, in his case here, um, he's coated himself in mud, and now there are a lot of mechis and things that are obviously bugging him. So quite an irritation. <coughs> well, this picture brings back many, many good memories. Um, it's probably one of my favorite sightings I've ever had in the bush, a leopard carrying a cub. Um, we spoke about the, um, the quality of guiding in the area. Um, and it's not to say that in other reserves, the guiding isn't of the same quality. Um, but this is what I was talking about, about putting um, years and years and years and generations of practice between wildlife and humans to get this understanding and to build this trust to allow us to see sites like this. You know, you've got to think of a leopard. What is a leopard? A leopard na by nature is very shy, elusive. Um, they don't like to be seen. They like to hide away. Um, so to be able to witness or to be able to have a female leopard like this um, carry her cubs right in front of the vehicle um, just shows how much trust she puts in us. There's another one. So this is the same leopard with the same cubs. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see this log here. That's actually the den site. Um, so you can see these cubs are still relatively small. Um, once again, all the hard work by the guides being put in, you can see that they all relax. Mom's not even looking at the vehicle. The youngsters are too busy um, attacking mom. Um, so not a care in the world for us sitting there. Another favorite of mine. Um, what actually happened this day uh, was that my friend and I were out on drive, we were looking for leopards in the southeastern section of the, of the property um, and he came across this female. She then was walking through the clearings and him and my, 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 my partner, my friend and I were driving around and having walk-bys with her and she was going and standing on top of uh, termite mounds. Um, I had some photographers on the vehicle as well, so we were getting in position, getting some nice shots of her up on the mound. Um, and then there was a, a massive mound that was coming up in the direction uh, that she was walking to. Uh, so I said to my guests in my tracker, let's go and park around and get on the right side of the sun um, and see if we can get her coming face up over the termite mound with the golden sun behind us. Um, and she walked towards the termite mound. I told everybody to get ready. And at that minute, she came walking around the side and our plan had failed. So it didn't work out for us. but what she did is she went to this hole uh, made by an art fark in the termite mound and she started chuffing um, and she brought us this little fur ball. Um, so an incredible moment, um, very, very special, not something that many people get to see, um, but when you spend extended period, we need to try that again, Trevor, when you spend extended period, uh, periods of time out in the field, um, you do start to get to witness some of the rarer things. Okay, just hippo yawning. Pile in some beautiful light. So here you can see, a bit, obviously it's not a very wide angle shot, but these, these are the grass plains. And, you know, impalas are such underestimated animals. There's so many of them. Whenever you go on safari, you are oh, another impala, another impala, another impala. But they are so important in the food chain. And what you see here is this female impala is moving uh, out into one of the clearings. Um, they use it for safety at night, um, just to avoid any predators. Obviously, being out in the grass, they can scan the area around them, and they can they can then obviously keep an eye open for any danger. Another one. So this is a hyena den, um, very cute little smirk. Um, 
don't really know what he's thinking, probably a little bit confused about us being there. Very tiny. Um, hyenas like this will stay this color up until about three months of age where they start then to develop the spots on their body. Um, but once again, coming back to all the effort that gets put in by um, the individuals out in the field every single day and just um, obviously having those, having those um, ethics um, that all the guides are following um, just creates us all to have and share chances like and experiences like this. Nice close up of an Ellie. Leopard walking towards me. Zebra, beautiful light. Um, so I also mentioned the Drakensberg mountain range earlier on. Um, this is the Drakensberg mountain range that you can see here. Um, it creates for some of the most spectacular um, sunsets. And um, I was very privileged to see a number of sunsets here. Um, it's not to say that other sunsets are worse, but I think any one of you who has been to um, Africa, whether it has been to the Sabi Sands or East Africa, or wherever it may be, will agree with me that South Africa, or that Africa um, has some of the most exquisite sunrises and sunsets. Um, and this is no different. Being out in the middle of nowhere, no light pollution, um, and I mean, just look at the color in the sky there. How's everybody doing there? Still with me? Another one, sunrise. Beautiful sunrise. It's pretty much perfect for me. Nice marilla tree, although I would love, I mentioned I had a love of leopards. I would love a leopard sitting around about here. Um, but the sunrise will do. Um, another one of the Drakensberg mountain range. So um, it also varied. These, these sunsets were never the same. Um, the colors in the skies often changed from um, beautiful orange colors to purple colors to beautiful dark blue colors. Um, so anyone that's obviously seen sunrises and sunsets in Africa will know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, here's another beautiful one, one of my favorites with the reflections in the water. The night sky. So this is another part of um, safari that I absolutely love. Not necessarily taking the photograph of it, um, but the canvas of, of stars. I mean, it is simply incredible. And I'm sure all of you that have been on safari will agree with me. When you sit out in the middle of nowhere, um, no towns or cities anywhere close by and you look up at the sky and you can see the Milky Way and you just have this incredible array of light above you. It is, it is magical. It is very special to experience. And, um, and what, what I really love about them is um, I used to, and I still do it with guests, um, when I was returning to camp, um, I would stop... Um, I would stop for 10, 15 minutes just before we got back to camp and say to the guests, you know, let's just sit here with the engine off, be quiet, look up at the stars and just take it all, all in. Just think of where you are. Think you're in the middle of nowhere, listen to the sounds. It could be a fiery neck nightjar calling or, a, or an owl calling or a male lion calling in the distance. Just sit there and absorb your surroundings and take it in. It's, it's, that's what it's about. That's what the safari is about. And, you know, one of the nice things about South African safaris and safaris in the Sabi Sands is that you can do night drives. So you um, can spend extended periods of time out at night um, exploring and seeing more nocturnal animals, but also um, being able to do this and just sit under the stars and, and, and observe them. Okay, I included this picture. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have been on safari or have been on safari in South Africa, um, but this is pretty much what the vehicles look like. There's no roof above you, so um, you've got an open space. You do feel quite vulnerable, and vulnerable is not the correct word because um, you still feel safe, but you feel out there. You feel like you are in the bush. Um, I know that a lot of different places do use roofs, especially further up in, in Africa, um, but this allows you to pretty much have a view of everything. So a bird flying over, um, you just open to the elements and you really feel like you are right there with the animals. <clears throat> Another one here. Um, 
<coughs> excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> Talking about um, <clears throat> the guide etiquette, it's, it's something that I love in the area is that I've been fortunate to visit or frequent a few a few um, of the uh, lodges in the southern section as well as the northern section of the sands and um, a big part of a guide's job is obviously understanding animal behavior and as you can see here in this corner um, there's two lions sleeping we are a mere what eight, 10 meters away from them and they couldn't care about us at all um, and once again just that goes to show the uh, just goes to show the um, the trust between us and them. Ah, one of my favorite things on safari, I'm sure many will agree. Um, now in South Africa, apart from doing uh, private safaris where you can spend, um, depending on where you go, you can spend extended periods of time out or all day out in the field. Uh, game drives generally consist of a morning game drive and an afternoon game drive and they last for roughly three, three and a half hours. Um, and depending on what you're seeing and what you're not seeing, um, you'll stop in the morning for a cup of coffee or a nice hot cup of hot chocolate, um, stretch the legs and then just discuss the morning's happenings. Um, I appreciated them, especially in the winter months. So between June and August, when it is nice and chilly and fresh out there, um, it is always good to, to get off and it just gives you a different feel, you know, you, just to walk 10, 15 meters away from the car. Once again, like I mentioned with the stars, being able to just really appreciate and take in what, what uh, or where you are um, is very special. So here's another one. Sorry, I've had to add um, this image. It's of the same sighting um, of the female I showed you earlier. Um, this for me is one of my most memorable photographs um, and the reason for it is I parked very far away from her to give her space. You can see she's walking through a clearing and she wasn't even walking towards me. She was walking at an angle, a 45 degree angle across us and she turned and she started walking straight towards us. And I picked up my camera also thinking that I want to enjoy this experience but I just wanted literally one or two shots of her coming towards me. I lifted my camera and I was shaking. I mean, it was an unbelievable sighting. Having her walk towards me, I took two pictures and I could feel tears. Okay, I shouldn't admit this, but I could feel tears running down my face. Um, it was an unbelievable moment. And I actually put my sunglasses on and turned around and spoke to the guests just so that they couldn't see my tears. You know, us as guys, we've got to be all rough and hardcore, um, but just, yeah, I had to hide a tear or two there. But very, very special uh, moment for myself. This one, another great one. I <coughs> shared an image um, with, with you at the beginning. I am going to... Um, I am going to blow my own horn here uh, just because I feel like I can. Um, and it comes down to predicting, predicting animal behavior. So along with the, the rest of the wild, our team, we all have previous guiding experience, which helps. But in this case, what happened was, um, was while I was still full-time guiding, uh, we had been searching for this cheetah for about two and a half hours in the afternoon. Um, we eventually found him as the sun was starting to set. Um, I had a group of photographers, so obviously light was quite crucial. Um, we tried to position ourselves in the correct area to get a bit of um, nice lost golden light on, on his body, got some photos. And I looked up ahead of us and about 150 meters ahead of us was this fallen over log. And I turned around to my guest and I said, I know we're losing light, but let's take a risk, high risk, high reward. Let's move up ahead, park next to, um, or position ourselves alongside this log with the sun behind. And let's try for this cheetah to come jump up on the log and have the sun setting behind the cheetah. And I think it would be a great way to end the, the trip. Now, obviously it might not happen, but let's give it a bash. Um, so guests all tentatively agreed with me. We moved um, and we went and we stopped and we positioned ourselves and the cheetah slowly came ambling along, marking on this tree, marking on that tree and got about 10 meters away from this tree and he just ran and he jumped straight up on top of it and he started to pose. Um, and at that point, I actually felt like a hero. Um, shutters were going off. 
Um, and yeah, it's just an incredible sighting and an incredible um, way to show how forward thinking and guiding experience and what we do is so crucial in, um, in getting those photographs. Um, but having said that, all the photographs that I've shown you here, it's not just about photography. And for me, it's not just about photography, it's about the experience. So whether you are a photographer or not, you're still gonna enjoy sites like this. Um, so being with professional guides and having the guidance of guys like myself and the rest of the team, whether you are taking a photograph of it or not, you're still gonna be out there having an incredible experience and you're gonna be learning about um, the local area um, and the history of that area. Another one, as you can see, I love leopards. It's one of the main reasons why I went to the Sabi Sands. Um, just to get back to um, Andrew's question earlier about leopards, why are there so many leopards in the Sabi Sands? Well, there's been a very lengthy process that has gone into it. Um, obviously, a number of years ago, the leopards were very, very shy and elusive, and you wouldn't even get a glimpse of them. And um, what happened was a lot of the guys, so John Varty was one of them, would spend hours, weeks, months out in the field trying to habituate these leopards. Um, and that meant in those days, it meant baiting them. So using impala, using meat and that to try and attract them in. Um, and then it became about finding den sites and spending time around those den sites, getting those youngsters used to vehicles. Um, then those youngsters growing up um, used to vehicles, having their offspring of their own which are then also used to the vehicles and it's all a part of the habituation process um, and a number of lodges in the area started this process um, and over a number of years we're not just talking one two three four five years we're talking 15 20 25 30 years three four different generations of leopards to get them as habituated um, as they are now um, and along with that process it's the Sabi Sands is ideal in terms of vegetation and space for leopards. It's um, got very dense vegetation. You know, they're shy, elusive, they're ambush hunters, so they like dense vegetation. It's got a lot of riverine areas. We mentioned the Sabi River, the Sand River, um, and the Manuleti River, which are ideal hunting places for, for leopards. Um, and there's also a lot of rocky outcrops, um, a lot of kopis, which are, make perfect den sites for leopards. So combining the, um, the habituation process with these animals and the habitat um, of the reserve creates, um, creates a very good space for leopards to thrive. Another nice close-up of a lion. Big hippo yawning. Lion in some beautiful light. And another one of my favorites lioness carrying a cub. Um, I know it's, you're going to run out of time shortly, but I do want to share this story with you as well. Um, myself and my tracker found this lioness on a kill um, the night before, and um, we wanted to return the next day because the guests had heard from one of the other lodges that these females had cubs. So what we did is we returned the next day and um, the food was finished and the lines were gone. So we had to start the whole tracking process again. Myself and Tracker got off and there was line tracks going here, going there, going everywhere. And um, we then started the process of trying to work out where they had gone. Um, and it got to the point where we got a bit frustrated. We were two, two and a half hours into, um, into, the, um, into the, the tracking process and Eventually, my tracker spotted a tawny eagle and a batalia sitting in the tree, which are good indicators that there's a predator close by. So we walked uh, towards the Manuleti River bed, and as we got to the top of it, there was a bit of an embankment. We saw this lioness with her cubs. Um, so we were obviously super excited, super stoked. We ran back to the car, told the guests about it, obviously explained that we couldn't potentially get close to them, but we might have a good view of the youngsters from a fair distance away. And this, this particular photograph means a lot to me because as we were navigating our way off-road um, towards the Manuleti, she, she came up the embankment and walked straight towards us with this cub in its mouth. And you can see its beautiful facial expression here. Okay, another nice photo of a rhino. Beautiful leopard again. As you can see, I do love leopards. 
And that's the end of it. I want to end with this quote. It says, if you work with nature, she works with you in a forgiving and enduring partnership, um, which I think is important and something that we should all, that we should all remember. Um, I see that I do have a few questions here. So obviously I do, there's a bit of a time limit, um, but I will try and answer as many as I can here. Um, Andrew, why are so many leopards in Sob Sands? I've answered that. Um, how long did I train for until I was allowed to guide? So um, I trained for, I'd say probably about a year. Um, I was fortunate in that I went through a company called Eco Training. Um, and they took me on board uh, for about a few months after I got my first qualification, um, just to pretty much learn the ropes and um, just, you know, follow the trainers and get a bit more knowledge. But yeah, my whole process before I started guiding took about a year. Um, in South Africa, legally, you're only allowed to guide from uh, 21 years of age. You need a PDP, which is a public driver's permit. Um, and obviously at that time I was too young. So I did a lot of walking safaris at the time, um, which I really, really loved. And it's a completely different part of safari. It's another thing that you can do in the Sabi Sands, um, a different offering, getting off the vehicle, being on foot. It's a completely different feel to being in a, in a vehicle. Yes, I mentioned earlier, being in the vehicle, you feel, you feel like you're out there with the animals. Um, but being on foot is just one more, um, one more step closer. Um, Turgay, what were my settings for the cub sighting? I don't have my external on me now, so I can't really see it, but I will send you a personal uh, mail with the settings from, from that sighting. And then, what safaris do I host in the Sabi Sands? Um, Currently, I, I don't have anything on the go. Um, there is talks uh, over the next coming while. Obviously, with lockdown, we're unsure of when we can um, start planning some of these trips. But I do have a few trips in mind to explore the Sabi Sands. The reason why I wanted to talk about the Sabi Sands today, firstly, like I mentioned, it is my favorite um, destination. We're fortunate in that we visit a number of different destinations. Um, but it is... Um, it is my favorite destination. I always love returning there and I can guarantee you um, that I will be putting a safari to this destination sometime in the not so distant future. Uh, I Trevor give that properties have traversing rights and the concessions of some of the property very river access. How are leopard sightings in some of the smaller properties? Um, so you specifically, Mandeep, um, you mentioned Juma and Elephant Plains. Uh, I did quite a few safaris um, up north uh, a couple of years ago. And what I really enjoyed about it, the same as the southern section, is that the northern properties, they are smaller, but the big section of it um, is uh, shareholders. So um, owned by families and things. So there's not a lot of activity from other vehicles. There's, Actually, in, in the Northern Sands, there, there's, two, there's two main commercial lodges that operate on a massive piece of land. Um, and that is, I think, Cheetah Plains and Juma, they work together. Um, and leopard sightings up there are also great. Um, I think anywhere you go in the sands, um, the sands is such a diverse area, but it's fortunate that it's got um, the rivers that run through uh, the properties as well as massive drainage lines and that's ideal for for leopards are there any other questions before we wrap up here um, Jennifer Sabi Sands spelt Sabi um, and the town is Sabi uh, to be honest with you Jennifer I'm not sure why it doesn't have an E um, what I will do though, is I'm going to get back to you. So I know I've got your email. I know I've been in touch with you before. Um, so I will do a little bit of research on that and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Are there any other questions? I hope that you all enjoyed it at the bottom here. I just wanted to thank you all for joining me. I hope that you enjoyed it. Um, thank you for your time. Um, my Instagram is Trevor McCall Pete, all lowercase. Um, or lowercase letters or if 
if you do want to get in touch and chat about um, about the Sabi Sands and possibly doing trips to the Sabi Sands, drop me an email. I'll gladly assist you. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this. I wanted to share my, my passion with you about the Sabi Sands and a little bit about the history. Um, I think a lot of us don't get that opportunity um, or hear that side of it. We go on safari and we see all the animals. But what really is a highlight for me and what stands out um, about the Sabi Sands is just understanding the amount of work that has been put into the area over a number of years to restore it to its natural state before the fences and things were put, were put up. Um, okay, great everyone. Thank you all for your questions. Thank you all for your engagement. Thank you for joining and I'll be hosting another one of these in the not so distant future. Um, so until then, I'm gonna say good night, goodbye, and have a lovely evening wherever you may be.